welcome to EPAR Trade Live. Uh, today's session is High Performance and Racing uh, Driveline Solutions, presented by Paul Lee, uh, owner of McLeod Racing and FTI Performance, plus the NHRA Nitro Funny Car Driver. Uh, Jim O, Jim Oberhofer, a noted uh, NHRA crew chief for decades, and Greg Samuel, founder of FTI Performance. Uh, I'm John Kilroy, Chief of Content and Audience Development for EPAR Trade. Welcome. And now just some quick uh, kind of housekeeping notes on what we're doing here. All the webinar attendees will be on mute the entire time of the webinar so that we can proceed without distractions or interruptions. And then we recommend switching to speaker view uh, on Zoom. Uh, and, and right away, we want to get your questions on uh, drive-by solutions, uh, especially in drag racing. So uh, you can give us a question, just click on the chat option at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And you can type in your question there, and we want to collect questions and go over them in the course of this next hour. So you're welcome to send us a question right now. Thank you. Um, when it comes to helping anybody who's struggling with Zoom, unfortunately, we can't help you right now. So um, you know, it just, if you're having trouble, maybe go to zoom.us to download the software or figure it out. Sorry. And then uh, we want you to know also that this uh, a session of EPAR Trade Live is being recorded and will be available for viewing at a later date. And then just a quick note on uh, EPAR Trade. Uh, we've been around for two years now and it's really been a fun project. It's a, a really robust, sophisticated digital platform for the racing industry to help everybody source uh, racing products and suppliers. Uh, the, the concept here is that we're catching up with the, for the racing industry on just contemporary digital technology and you can use EPAR Trade 24 seven from wherever you are. And you can shop the world because there's no real borders on the internet. And then increasingly in racing, there's, there's less and less uh, borders in sourcing products for uh, going fast. Uh, we ask everyone to register on EPAR Trade. It's similar to getting a credential for a trade show. And it's another way to keep it kind of racing industry only and not just race fans or real hobbyists. Uh, EPAR Trade puts up basically the entire racing industry online, so 25,000 racing organizations at your fingertips, almost 6,000 suppliers throughout the world, over 16,000 racing businesses or buyers, over 2,000 professional race teams, uh, and it's only for sourcing. It's not an e-commerce site, so we for sure don't want to compete with uh, warehouse distributors, with uh, speed shops, or anybody in terms of selling parts. All we do is, is help you source products and source suppliers. Our smart sourcing software gives you more convenience, more options, quicker access to solutions. So that's my uh, quick commercial for EPAR Trade. Thank you. And now we, we come to the speakers today. We're, we're really pleased to have them on board with us and participate with EPAR Trade. Uh, Paul Lee, uh, McLeod Racing. And McLeod Racing's uh, been one of my favorite companies in the racing industry. I've uh, watched them for decades. And they've just always been on top of the game. They've always had great people. They've always had great products. And McLeod's has been a rock steady company just year in and year out. And that's really hard to do in the racing business uh, over decades. Um, uh, Paul Lee's passion is uh, NHRA drag racing. He started when he was 17. He's got quite an educational uh, history as well as a history in racing. Uh, summa cum laude, a graduate from the Wharton Business School at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, he just uh, loves being in racing uh, and loves being the owner of McLeod and then uh, purchased FTI Performance in 2019. Uh, Jim uh, Oberhofer uh, is crew chief for Paul Lee Racing, just decades in NHRA drag racing, just recognized as one of the best. And I think with uh, Paul and Jim working together, I think Paul just logged uh, as fast as the last time, I think, in, in a funny car, so 3.935. So they're getting faster, watch out for them. And then Greg Samuel has been in the transmission business since 1992, another great company, FDI Performance Research and Development, is just producing new products virtually on a daily basis from uh, stock to top sportsmen, from street to pro mod. So that's kind of uh, what we're doing here. And then uh, Paul, I'll just kind of turn it over to you for a minute, just to kind of, are there any initial thoughts you wanna share as you talk to the racing industry and? And we have people here who uh, maybe just kind of in a more of a grassroots race team 
but then we may have some uh, real professional car builders uh, in the room as well. So would you like to share some thoughts as far as where McLeod Racing is right now? Yeah, well, thanks. It's uh, good to be here with you guys and uh, happy to see all these faces on, uh, on board here. Yeah, I mean, McLeod Racing, we've been around, uh, the company's been around since 1971. And, it are, and is one of the founding members of uh, SEMA and PRI. And, um, you know, it has a long history of racing and uh, street performance. Um, you know, in the last year or so, we've literally just, you know, we've, we've never slowed down. And it's good to see that our industry is still strong through all this, uh, you know, uh, disaster that we're going through right now in the country. But as far as the, you know, we're in the hobby business, and and as far as the hobbyists go, all of us are all of us on here are car enthusiasts. This is our passion: is cars and hot rods and drag racing or any kind of whatever racing that you're into. This is our passion, and it's good to see how healthy. It's really refreshing to see how healthy our industry is right now, because uh, our business, both McLeod and and uh, and FTI, and Greg can uh, you know uh, he can vouch for this as well. We've just literally been non-stop uh, full throttle you know all all through this which shows me that the you know that the uh, automotive aftermarket is healthy and strong and it's really really good to see that you know uh, our passion is uh, is thriving through all this uh, all these issues and that's great that's what we've seen at epart trade there, there was just an initial shock in march or april where everybody couldn't believe what was happening but then everybody kind of got back to business and and we're seeing a kind of a steady pace at epart trade as well and uh, when we go through some of these national or international disasters, I always feel like I'd rather be uh, going through it with racers than any other industry because racers rise to the challenge and uh, they just don't accept defeat. So we'll get through this. And then, uh, Greg, I, I just kind of want to open the floor for you and FGI performance uh, in addressing the racing industry. Is there any kind of thing that you want to just kind of catch them up with in, in regards to FGI? Uh, as far as new product development or, or, you know, where the company's going, our vision. Yeah, just, just kind of where you're at right calling. now. Where's the company going? Uh, you know, uh, by joining force with McLeod and, and Paul, it's really opened me up to be able to do more of what I do best, which is develop product. I'm not real good at cleaning the toilet, people. <laughs> so, you know, by, by us being able to get me to where I could develop more product, we continue to grow the company and it's it's – Getting me right, take some of my hands out of the uh, the management aspect of it and put more into the development uh, processes, which, which I really like to do. And in turn, we're going to continue to make more and more uh, products that, that nobody else has ever seen or had or even tested that, that we're testing daily. And, and yes, the code, you know, this disaster deal is uh, we've stayed very busy throughout it, but it's also gave me a little time to uh, work on some stuff uh, that it, if we weren't trying to keep going on a racetrack every day, it allowed me to work on some stuff that hasn't been going down. And in the next three, four weeks here, y'all going to see some pretty impressive press releases on some new products that develop. Very cool. Thank you. And then, uh, Jim, uh, are, are you on board here? I don't quite see your face. And I, I just wanted to ask you, you seem to be getting faster with the race team there. Do you want to tell you, tell everybody what you're doing? Say it again. Well, you know, uh, for, for me, um, uh, it's, it's pretty neat to be able to work with, uh, with Paul Lee and, and then uh, Greg, um, just from a standpoint, you know, I spent a number of years, you know, almost 31 years at Coletta Motorsports and um, never really messed with anything, you know, that McLeod has to offer or FTI has to offer. So for me, this is a uh, something new for me, you know, learning um, about FTI, about McLeod and, and uh, the excitement that Greg, both Greg and Paul bring to both of those companies is pretty amazing uh, to me. And, um, you know, for me, um, you know, Paul's given me this great opportunity to where I can kind of have my cake and eat it too. You know, I get to go out and tune his, his race car and work with, you know, he's, he's like my brother. And, um, you know, he's just an amazing guy. I love him to death. And I, I wouldn't want to race with anybody else. And, um, but I also own my own business here, Victory Lane Quick Oil Change in Plano, Texas. And, um, you know, to Paul's point, you know, there's a lot of people now that are taking care of their cars. Uh, they're, they're not going out buying brand new cars. They're, they're looking at um, hanging on to their money. They're looking at taking care of their cars. So, you know, our business is, um, it's, it's not doing quite as well as what FTI and McLeod are, but we're getting there. We're getting better each day. And, and uh, 
as I tell everybody at the end of the day, it's like I got to go. It's like I did the bottom end on a on Paul's funny car. I've got oil all over me. I'm a mess at the end of the day, but I enjoy it. <laughs> That's great. I, I'd like to remind everybody in the audience again that uh, we want to hear your questions. Uh, so just uh, there's a option at the bottom of the Zoom screen for chat. So just open that up, type in your questions, and uh, we'll get to your questions as we get them. Okay, thanks. And, and Jim, uh, you all seem to be going faster right now. W what are you working on as far as the race team? Well, you know, with Paul's car, I mean, we're so fortunate. You know, um, when we put this team together, Paul just said, hey, go do what you think we need to do, you know, as far as um, getting the parts and pieces that you need. And, um, you know, I, I tried to uh, – I wanted to get some stuff from Coletta Motorsports. They didn't have enough uh, to supply us to get the team going. So I called up my good friend, Don Schumacher. And Don, he says, I've got whatever you need, Jimmo. And then um, uh, then he asked me a question that's always tough to answer. He says, Jimmo, which one of my crew chiefs would you want to work with uh, the most? And um, I said, well, that's not a fair question because they're all great guys over there. I'd work with any one of them. But Ron Tobler has been a friend of mine. And... Um, Ron, he stepped right up. He says, hey, Jimmo, I want to help you, you know, kind of pay back for you helping me when I first came to Coletta Motorsports with Dougie's car. And um, Ron's been great, uh, you know, to work with. Um, you know, being able to uh, get parts of that Napa tune-up and have Ron and his Napa team over there helping us assemble uh, Paul's car was just, you can't put a price tag on that. And, um, you know, Ron gave us something to work with, and we've been working with it and trying to uh, get better, but not only get better for ourselves, but we're also trying to do our best to to help the whole Don Schumacher organization, specifically the funny car operation, um, to take a take that next step, you know, especially with uh, Tommy Johnson's car and Ron Katz's car, because we all, as we call ourselves, we're the five-disc uh, mafia, five-disc uh, clutch mafia, and um the car is really great. You know, I, I knew I wouldn't have a problem tuning the engine or making clutch adjustments or anything like that. I, I knew my biggest struggle and challenge would be chassis setup and uh, making sure the body was right. And, um, you know, this past weekend we ran great. Problem is, is, you know, we need to give Paul a, a better car to drive. And um, Paul's a great driver. And unfortunately, you know, he's out there driving and everybody wants to put the, uh, Put the blame on the driver but i put the blame on myself that i didn't give him a, a good setup uh, we get we had a good engine setup good clutch setup. it was just we needed the car to be right so it would drive straight so we identified some things this weekend uh, after this weekend and uh, we're excited that we're going to get back out there uh, on saturday and make some more runs at indy and I'm, I, we're looking forward to a great weekend okay that's great jim well good luck um i have a question for paul uh, with the return of drag racing, uh, NHRA's TV ratings were higher than F1, NASCAR, Xfinity, and the Truck Series. Uh, this is from Krista Baldwin. Uh, how does portraying FTI and McLeod on the side of the funny car beneficial to the companies? So I guess well, what, what is the return that you're seeing? Well, I mean, we are, I mean, uh, I know that uh, the old adage, there's an old cliche that I think, uh, Bob Tasker's grandfather came up with years ago is race on Sunday, sell on Monday. And I think that's, that's as true today as it was 40 years ago when he said that. Um, our industry is, is, is uh, we, you know, our customers are the hobbyists. You know, they're the racers, the race fans, the people out there are passionate about cars. So, and this has gone on for many years. This is one of the reasons, I mean, I, of course, I love being in drag racing. I love driving my funny car, but it's also business too. I mean, uh, when it's all it's for many years, uh, every time I've raced, I've been part time, uh, you know, for the last eight or nine years, I've been part time. But every time we've raced the car, we've had McLeod on the car or FTI or, you know, we advertise, we have dealer of the race sales through Jags or Summit. And every time we race that week and uh, to with, you know, bar none is the busiest week we've, we have in, in months. So, which tells me that the people are watching the races and they are loyal to the people who are part of drag racing, in particular our sport drag racing, that advertise and market through the racing. I mean, we see sales go through the roof the week following a race every time and it's been going on for years. 
So, it, you know, it is a cliche race on Sunday, sell on Monday, but it is really true in our industry. So, uh, you know, having it, it, this week, right, at, we, you know, the, the ratings are, were great with Fox Sports. We were on the major Fox the network, uh, not just FF, FS1 this week. It was on Fox. And uh, both FTI and the cloud sales are just going through the roof this week, which, uh, which, which shows that, you know, we really have loyal customers in our industry, and it's good to see. It's an old formula, and it's always glad to hear that it still works. It's kind of a rock-solid formula. And then I'll, I'll do another question for you, Paul. Um, this is from Walt. Uh, basically, the, the pros and cons for a clutch versus converter in a blown alcohol 7.0 Pro ET altered. Yeah, I think that's more of a question for Greg, since, uh, you know, he's the, you know, because you know a lot of people call Greg and ask him that very question. Greg, what do you what's your thoughts on that? I, you know, I, this could be a long answer. So I'm going to try to keep it short um, and kind of give you a little general idea. Uh, a clutch cannot multiply torque, and uh, when I get that gentleman underneath in there, Jimbo, let me put a verter in that fuel card, and we're really going to have some fun. But um, <laughs> in, a, in a situation where you're using an automatic type transmission, power glide, a 400, whatever. That I mean, granted, it's a manual transmission, but it's a uh, driven by a torque converter, then a converter can multiply a torque. It'll be more consistent. So if you got a, a blown 7.0 Pro ET altered, you're, you're basically in a fast bracket race class. And the most consistent deal you can do there is run a converter versus a clutch. You know, as a clutch disc thins, I'm not a clutch professional by no means. They, they change their air gap and so forth. And you're not ever going to be able to keep it consistent. And particularly in back-to-back, -back, what we call the round robin late rounds, when we're making a lap every 20, 30 minutes, you really want to go with a converter for consistency. Okay, and then another question for you, Greg, and this is again from Krista. Uh, mm -hmm. Since the rise of high horsepower race cars and street cars becoming the norm, uh, how do you continue to accommodate and adapt the converters and transmissions to fit the needs? Well, it, it definitely keeps me on my toes. Uh, in the last 10, 12 years, you know, the phone call, the average phone call is, hey, I got a 500 horsepower LS street car. Uh, I personally drive a 1,000 horsepower LS street car. It gets 20 miles to the gallon. So, as time has changed, I've had to adapt with it. We've had to come up with better materials, better heat treat, cryogenics, uh, different stator designs, different pump turbine designs. You, you have to stay on top of the game. If you think what worked 10 years ago is going to work today, it, it won't. You have, to, you have to keep going up in power. And through our technology, we are actually going back to smaller diameter converters now that multiply more torque for even higher horsepower engines. We're running 10 inch converters by 43 and 4400 horsepower, which five years ago you would have to run 11 inch to even think about it. So that just tells you how the stator designs through software, uh, machining centers, we have some of the most up to date machining centers that they can be bought. And by doing so, with the guys that I got in my machine shop, I can go down there and go, I need this. And they make me that. And then we test it and it works. Sometimes it doesn't, but that's how we stay in front. We test and we test a lot. That's great. And the clutch is the same way, uh, John. Um, yeah. You know, the evolution of the high horsepower cars and in the clutch side of the uh, market, uh, back in the 80s, uh, the way they handled high horsepower um, was to throw a heavy uh, pressure plate on it. I meaning a uh, heavy uh, spring pressure pressure plate that would take a, you know, 200 pound guy to, you know, for, with a big left leg to push it in. They handled it with a heavy pressure plate. I see Sam Oxier on here. He, he knows what I'm talking about because he used to run pro stock back in the seventies. And when they had horsepower, they just threw a heavy pressure plate on it. Right, Sam? Well, in the eighties, um, you know, in the late eighties, Red Roberts, the founder of McLeod, he, you know, he figured, you know, okay, well, let's let's handle that higher horsepower with surface area so he he was the first guy you know owning mcleod to come up with a double disc clutch for the street market high performance street market and in racing so he put two discs way before anybody put two discs in a clutch and therefore he could use a, a lighter uh cone pressure plate which you know the pressure the, uh, the pedal pressure will be a lot lighter but you could still hold a high horsepower so as time goes on now we have we, it's common every day that we get calls with guys with streetcars with 900 to 1,000 horsepower, right? So, and we handle that with uh, two discs and a lighter cone pressure plate. So the surface area of the disc and the evolution of materials in the disc has allowed us to handle 1,000, 1,200 horsepower, 1,400 horsepower everyday streetcars and have the pedal pressure of a stock 
a Honda or a Toyota. It's really incredible uh, that the evolution of the materials and the pressure plates and that, you know, uh, have, have, have been able to easier handle that higher horsepower cars today. So now it's pretty common to have, you know, 12, 1400 horsepower and drive it around on a daily basis without having, uh, having to weigh 240 pounds to push the pressure plate in. It's really the evolution of the power in the cars and the clutch materials has came full circle, have come full circle. And now it's, you know, that's an everyday uh, customer. It's one of the great things about this industry. I mean, there are things happening today that we couldn't imagine 10 years ago. And we just don't know what it's going to be like 10 years from now. Uh, so I'm, I'm getting more questions. Again, just go to the chat option at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Just type in your question. Um, this question is for Paul. Uh, what happened to five-speed box uh, from Kobe Chablet? Uh, I thought it would be better both on compact unit, replacing Muncie's and top loaders. Yeah, that was our, our muscle car five is, is what he's talking about, which is our, uh, our manual five-speed uh, transmission that we, we developed about eight or nine years ago. And it's the stock size of a Muncie or a T10. And, um, you know, we sold a lot of them, but, you know, it was very expensive to make. You know, we tried to make it here in the USA. We tried to, you know, I have everything made here in the USA. And there was a couple issues. Uh, one, we just couldn't make it cheap enough. We, we actually lost money on the transmission. And then, so, you know, we decided, you know, we sold more and more uh, Tremex now. So we're, we're, you know, one of, we're one of the leading Tremex sellers in the country. Uh, we're a major supplier of Tremex to a lot of the big companies now. So, you know, we said, okay, well, you know, we have the Tremex, we supply, we sell lots of Tremex. We don't have the headache of, of developing this, this, our transmission and, and actually losing money on it. So we basically decided recently to, to stop production of it. It wasn't because we didn't sell them. We sold every single one we made. It's just that it just um, business wise, we just couldn't make it uh, economically enough here in the U.S. And we wanted to keep, keep it made in the USA. And we, and so, you know, we just stopped making it for now. And, and we're just, we're selling lots of Tremex. So we basically just tran transferred our sales from the five speed uh, muscle car five to now we're just selling Tremex. We have them in stock and we're selling them like hotcakes. Great. Uh, this is an interesting question and I'll, I'll start with Jim O. Um, the question is, is there a future for composite driveline solutions for drag racing or racing in general? And uh, is that ever discussed? Is that ever, uh, Something people think about, Jim? Well, we've talked about it for a number of years. Um, you know, going back, uh, we've at, we actually looked at when I was at Coletta Motorsports, uh, Connie was very interested in building uh, carbon fiber clutch discs. And um, NHRA kind of put the kibosh on that. Um, you know, we're always interested in, in lightweight parts and driveline you know, driveline parts are always something very interesting. You know, when you get a top fuel car and you have a driveline failure of some sort, you, you know, you break a input shaft. Um, that's not very, very good. And it's, uh, it, it's a matter of who is going to be the pioneer. And I remember my, my mentor, Dick LaHaye used to tell me because Dick LaHaye and Connie Coletta, both legends in their own right, but they were very different. And, uh, Dick LaHaye used to tell me that, um, you know, things like that, you know, you need to be a pioneer and usually pioneers got shot in the rear end with arrows. <laughs> and, uh, but Connie Coletta, he'd be all about that. You know, he's, he's all for trying things like that. And um, it's really just a matter of who, like you probably want to put it in a dragster first. Uh, you certainly wouldn't want to try it in a funny car with, you know, the everything being underneath the, uh, the, the driver, you know, the driver sitting on top of the drive shaft and everything. So um, it's definitely something that there's interest in there. Um, the bottom line is, you know, how much does it cost and, and can it work in, in our environment? Um, you know, a nitro engine, you know, whether it's a top fuel or a funny car, they seem to wreak havoc on a lot of parts out there and um so it's really just a matter of finding somebody that's brave enough to try something like that and um and then just kind of move forward with it but i don't i, I think it's something that could definitely uh, you could definitely try okay, great. <laughs> i have kind of a general question for greg uh, greg 
when people call up to order a transmission and they have a certain transmission in mind, but then they describe the car and the engine and where they're at in racing, do you find that they sometimes have the wrong transmission in mind and you have to steer them over to the correct transmission? Uh, yes and no. Racers are generally pretty savvy. They, they are going to do their homework. They're going to do their study. They want to make sure that they're going to get their best bang for their dollar. They want to know what wins. Uh, they want to know what lasts. And ultimately, they want to know what's the most important in anything in life that we do any purchase with. And, and that's, to, you know, what kind of customer service am I going to get? So answer your question. Yeah, they call. They kind of know what they need. We really try to listen to them in their entirety. I want to know everything down to the – to the name of their firstborn child, what they what their intentions are, where do they yeah. want to go, everything, all that kind of it makes them start to become part of the family. Once I understand what they're after, my sales guy same way. Once they understand what they're after and and understand what type of person they are, then we go, okay, yep, you've picked the right trainer. You know what? You know maybe I need to school you a little bit about gear ratio and leverage and and the definition of torque. And so we try to educate the customer at the same time. The internet is as many people can educate themselves. The bad thing about the internet, if it's on yellow bullet, is gospel. So sometimes you have to educate as well as listen to what they got to say and determine what the best thing for their package is. Uh, you know, particularly gear ratio. Most of the time, they're they're pretty spot on with what they're looking for as far as a transmission and a converter. But we'll we'll definitely custom tailor it to make sure that they're getting exactly what they need, not what they don't need. To. Last thing I want to do, sell somebody something. They get home and it breaks and only to find out, well, why did you get that for your car? You know, that's not what you needed. It's, we're not here for that. We're, we're racers just, just like everybody here. I've, I've driven top dragster cars. I've, I've been sponsored by Budweiser. I've, I've professionally bracket raced. I've, I've snuck into the races when I was 16 in a trunk of a car so I could go racing. I mean, I'm a gearhead just like the rest of us. So I want to do everything I can to make sure that person that calls FTI is going to get the best product they can get for the money that they have to spend to make their car perform the best. Ultimately, that makes us look good. Okay, and then when it comes to drag racing transmissions and torque converters, is there kind of a, a mistake that, that people tend to make over and over again? Maybe once you've sold them the part or, you know, just the way they, they manage their system and, and you'd like to say, stop doing that. Uh, I'm gonna say the, the not really a mistake. Other, uh, there's a few installation errors that, that, that we really try to, to clarify that, that is really the lifeblood of a, of a transmission, you know, in automatic, we're going to call them automatic some are all full manual, but they're still automatic driven. Uh, you know, shifter adjustment is by far the, the, the biggest mistake we see. And for something that simple to, to wipe out a three, four, five, eight, ten thousand dollar transmission in a matter of minutes is, is, is tough. So we really try to educate the people on that we have videos on youtube and so forth about how to do it yeah. and if anybody has a question please call the shop ask the, the websites for both the cloud racing and fti performance are excellent and great sources of information so we're spending some time on them and then paul i'd kind of like to ask you that question too um is there some kind of issue that comes up over and over again and, and you try and spread the word that don't go down that road or fix that issue. And so we don't keep making the same mistake over and over again. Well, yeah, the biggest thing we've gotten year after year has been, uh, should I, you know, a lot of people on a street car, cause you know, most of our business is the high performance street market, right? Yeah. So uh, they want to run an aluminum flywheel versus steel flywheel. So, and that is the, that is the biggest thing. And a lot of people think they want to run an aluminum flywheel on the street and it's really not the way to go. It just, uh, because it's so light and it's a street car, you, you want that steel flywheel behind it for the centrifugal mass, right? Yeah. So the, for the inertia, and it's a, just a lot easier car to drive on the street with a steel flywheel versus aluminum. Now, aluminum flywheel obviously is a different animal and you want that for your racing, no matter what kind of racing, whether it's drag racing, road racing, because you want fast RPMs. But the other side of that coin is the RPMs come up fast, but they also go down fast. So for a street car, it, like I said, it's just a, it's just a harder car to drive. And some there's some people who insist on the aluminum flywheel, but we try to steal or steer uh, street car drivers um, with our clutches to a steel flywheel for the rotating mass. But that's something that continuously year after year, day after day, we get questioned. Yeah. Okay, and I have another good question uh, that, that's a good one to ask of you, Paul, in particular. 
Uh, as a successful businessman and owner, Paul, what are some tips for other manufacturers to follow to become successful like McLeod and FTI? Well, I, I, I know personally, I mean, uh, I, I like uh, to really at the top of my list is customer service. Um, the, when, I, when I first bought McLeod, they had a, uh, an automatic phone system you know, installed where the phone system would be automatic, uh, answered by a machine and you'd have to, you know, reroute your call to, you know, through the phone system. And I just hate that. You know, the first thing I did was yank that and throw it in the trash and get live people on the phone because, you know, we're all heart riders. We know when we call a manufacturer, we're calling someone, we want to talk to somebody. We don't want to go through a route of machines and, you know, uh, it's, you know, you know, everybody knows that everybody hates machine. Nobody wants to talk to machine. They want to talk to a live person and get routed to the right person as soon as possible. So, I mean, that's the very first thing we did was change that, you know, in McLeod and, and it's helped tremendously. I mean, customer service is the number one thing. I mean, you know, there's always issues. There's always customers that are going to have problems and you're not, you know, there's going to be angry customers. But the thing is, you just we have to handle with kid gloves and, and handle every customer like he's your last customer. And that's I think that's the number one thing that we do with both in the cloud and FTI. You know, Greg is awesome and great at customer service and handling employee or not employee, but uh, customers problems. So I think customer service is the number one thing. And as long as we keep people happy, uh, we keep a happy customer and a repeat customer is where you make your money. I think that's so important in the racing business in particular. I mean, we all gather every weekend and talk to each other and, and word of mouth happens and, and customer service gives you good, really good word of mouth out there. I'd like to ask a question of Greg, uh, and this is just kind of new products coming out at F FTI. I know on EPAR trade, you have uh, the Ford 6R80 torque converter. You want to talk about that, Greg, or something new coming out of FTI? Oh, we, we've been making them for a bit. They're billet converters, uh, street use, triple clutch. So you can lock them up under full throttle, you know, thousand horsepower to them. Back, back like we were talking about thousand horsepower street cars. That's part of the, the new stuff that we, we're constantly working on to, to deal with today's power levels. I mean, the, these, these mod motors and boost, man, it's so easy to make a thousand and you have to have these. And that's what these converters were designed for. Okay, great. And Paul, uh, McLeod has something new on EPAR trade, the SFT 2000 horsepower street strip clutch. You want to talk about that? Yeah, that's our newest. Um, I mean, it, like I said earlier, people are just coming up. The cars are just making more and more power. It's so easy with the superchargers and nitrous and all these different power adders to just make a lot of power. And because of customer demand, we have customers in their 2000 uh, horsepower street cars, you know, and uh, so, you know, Based on the customer demand, we had to, you know, come up with a, a clutch that, um, you know, handled the normal everyday driver that has that much power, and that's our newest uh, clutch unit out there. And we're at, we're selling them, so that, I mean, the people out there have power, and it, it's amazing how much power that, you know, a normal everyday driver street car has today. But uh, that that clutch can handle it. Yeah, very good. Okay, I, we have a question uh, for uh, Greg. And again, uh, people are writing in questions with the, the chat option at the bottom of the Zoom screen. So just write in your question. So Greg, uh, the question is, what are the effects of dump valves on the converters? Any changes internally should be done? Um, it, it, so a dump valve, that's kind of what we named it. We've actually been doing them for a long time, uh, manipulating pressure. No different like Jimmo there manipulates pressure in his fuel system or his clutch in, in that fuel car. Uh, we're manipulating converter pressure and the dump valve, so to speak, is is really a generic term for what we're doing. Uh, we use different orifices and electric solenoids to change the amount of flow of oil through the torque converter. Therefore, changing the stall torque ratio or the torque multiplication inside the converter and also changing how efficient the converter is. Now there's parameters on this, and I think I've reached both ends of it, uh, of how much pressure is too much and how, and, how, and how little pressure is not enough. You can do engine damage with it, done it, uh, paid the bill, uh, testing with them, but it's in today's turbo world, not necessarily should it be really used on the street, you really don't need it on the street, but the turbo world, the small cubic inch uh, motors with a turbo the size of that computer we're looking at on it, 
uh, it's very difficult to get them to spool. So we change the pressure inside the converter and then bring it back and make it lock up so forth. It's a very useful tool. As, as a golfer would say, it's another club in the bag. It's a necessary evil. You have to have it. We use it top dragster racing, super class racing, heads up racing. We, we, we make them up to five stages. So it, it's getting to be something that's used all the time. Now, as far as another question right down the line there is, you know, uh, uh, about internal and external. So there's internal and external places you can get rid of this fluid pressure. We go on this for hours, uh, but we manipulate it in several different locations, depending on the application of what you have. You have a 2JZ with a giant uh, turbo one, or you got a 600 inch motor with a pair of 88s. You know, you're gonna have to have, have it set up differently. But this is some of that technology that, that we talk about that things that I do versus cleaning the bathroom that, that I have to stay, stay focused on day to day. Yeah, very cool. Okay, here's another question, and um, I think it's kind of fun to reference the sponsors, so we're a little bit off topic, but I think it's a fair question, and there may be some owners of racing businesses, I'm sure there are in the audience. So Jim, I'll, I'll switch this to you. So you also own a Victory Lane for a oil change operation for just consumers, and it's my understanding that um, you and FTI and McLeod work with Global Electronics Technology for merchant services. And so we have a question, how's that working? And, and do you have something to say about global electronics technology and the credit card processing that they do? Well, I, I've got to tell you that it's working absolutely fantastic. And, um, you know, I, we've kind of always joked that, you know, we, we always get complimented on the speed of our service that we have here. We try to do an oil change, a thorough oil change in uh, 10 to 15 minutes, you know, so we, um, you know, in that 10 to 15 minutes, you know, we have an 18 point inspection of the vehicle, we do the oil change, but what people are most impressed with is how fast the credit card processing is. Um, they'll put their card in or they'll tap it and it immediately is approved and printing a receipt out. And they're, they're, they're just like, I've never seen something go that fast before. And uh, I never really paid attention to it until I, I had my own global terminal. And um, now when I go to like different places in the airport or different um, stores and, and I'm always checking out to see how fast the processing is. And it's definitely not as fast as what we have here at Victory Lane. So it, it's, a, it's a great service. Okay. Yeah, they're great people. And we've uh, we ran an article actually on, on their uh, merchant services and EPAR trade. And they're big sponsors in, in racing and race teams, as you well know. And uh, so it's, uh, it's great to recognize them. And Paul, did you have something to add? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, we use them at FTI and McLeod as well. I mean, there's a couple of things you look for in a credit card processor. One is price and the other is service, right? I mean, you want, you, you know, the speed of it is important, like uh, Jim was saying. And uh, in our case, though, we, we don't do a point of sale, so we're more of a uh, we, we, we more of like uh, call in uh, cards, but you know, it's also <laughs> fast, but you know, we save money on it and it, the customer service is great. I mean, so we, we've turned a lot of people on it. I mean, it's, it, it is a better price. They saved us a lot of money and, and they provide a better service. So that's what we look for in any of our vendors. And I mean, I recommend anybody out there, just give them a try, give them a, you know, ask for a quote and see what they can do. And uh, I'm almost going to guarantee you they'll, they'll give you a better deal and, and provide a better service. And that's what we're all looking for to improve our business. Yeah, very good. Okay, back to Jim. Uh, I have a question. How different is it tuning a top fuel dragster or a fuel funny car? Um, I would say, I mean, they're, they're, they're definitely different. You know, a dragster is 300 inches. The, the motor is uh, sitting over the rear tires, basically. And, and um you know, the funny car is 125 inches with a body on top of it and the motor sits out in front of the driver. So, you know, the, the easiest way to just to kind of compare the two is with a dragster, as far as a tuner, um, you have to be very aggressive, um, you know, on how you tune the car. And as a driver, you have to have finesse because it is a 300 inch wheelbase. It's real easy if you oversteer it, overdrive it to, um, get that thing whipping around out there to what which could cause some problems um for a funny car i always look at it you have to have some finesse to tune the thing um, so you you know you have to think about the fact that it it is a shorter wheelbase the motor's out in front and um 
you know, so you're, you're not getting all that, that traction that you would get on a dragster. So you have to have a little bit more finesse. And I always said that the driver had to be a little bit more of an animal driving a funny car. Um, you can't be both and you can't be aggressive as a, a driver and a tuner in a funny car. Uh, you'll fail, especially as uh, on the tuning side of things. Um, you know, the best, uh, when I was at Coletta Motorsports and I, I worked real close with my, uh, my brother, Jono and Nicky Bonifani back when he was, uh, tuning the DHL car with my brother. Um, we would always have about 10 thousandths more compression in the funny car because we felt that that little bit more compression ratio, even though it's very low in a nitro engine around 6.5 to 6.8 to one, um, we felt it gave more torque, which was better for the funny cars moving it because they were, you know, uh, I believe almost 300 pounds heavier. Now, with uh, the dragster, we always ran the supercharger about 5% faster than what we did with the funny car. So um, we always felt that the, the blower was more horsepower, especially out in the middle of the track. And um, you just couldn't have that kind of power with a funny car out in the middle of the track. So that's why you see some of the differences, um, you know, in, in, um, in speeds at the eighth mile, you know, drags will run a little faster because they do make more power. Um, but with the funny car, we try to create a little bit more torque. And, um, you know, it's, it's, they're both fun. They're both mechanically, they're, they're fun to work on. And if you have your, uh, if you pay attention all your notes over time, um, it's there, you can have a very successful car. It's really, it's, it's more about the, the, the group of people you have working on the car. Um, you know, the, the owner of the team, the, the driver, I mean, there's just so many things that go into making a great team and uh, we're, we're pretty fortunate, but I, I love running them both, but I, I'm really enjoying this funny car a lot. That's great. And then Jim, I just want to ask you, you spend a weekend at the track and, and maybe even just watching the sportsman classes. Do you see like uh, a repeated missed opportunity by some of the race teams when it comes to uh, drive lines? Like does something occur to you that, you know, if, if they tended to do this more and more or better and better, they'd be faster. Are there any missed opportunities and drive line solutions that you see? Well, as far as what, you know, what we're doing on the, the, uh, the nitro side with the funny cars and the dragsters, I mean, there's, there's always opportunities out there to do something. Unfortunately, a lot of those opportunities um, cost money. Now, uh, Greg was talking about a torque converter, you know, in a, in, a, um, in a fuel car. And that's something that's very, very interesting to me. And I know that they're, they're doing more. You know, those things are in the pro, uh, pro mod cars and those cars make a lot of power. And, um, you know, and Greg's confident he could build something for, uh, you know, a nitro application. And that would be something for me that I would definitely be interested in down the road. Now, the real problem comes um, to getting it accepted by NHRA because, you know, when you go to NHRA and you have something like this, you have to present to them, why do you want to have this? You know, what is safer about it? What is more cost effective about it? So on and so forth. Um, most of the time, and I think I speak for every crew chief out there, when we come up with an idea, um, it's performance in mind. So somehow along the line, Greg, we've got to figure out how we can go and say this is safer and this is more cost effective to the teams. But um, that would be something that I would love personally to, you know, be involved in someday. And, you know, and having Greg kind of there with us, I think that would be a pretty neat, pretty neat project moving forward if, if we can pull off something like that in uh, one of these 11,000 horsepower race cars. Well, what do you think about that, Greg? I, you know, that's a, 11,000 is a big number. Uh, we've seen 5,200 on an axle dyno with a torque converter so far at the axle. Um, that's, that's a far stretch from 11,000. So I, I got a lot to learn. I need to go spend more time with Paul and Jim at the track and, and truly understand it. But I'm, I'm definitely up for the challenge. I just I might have to take some of our older race motors. I'm going to burn up the good stuff doing it. But I, I, I would love to do it. I, I think it's the future of it, to be honest with you. Like I said before, a clutch can't 
multiply torque and a converter can. That's why, I mean, they're not horsepower converters, they're torque converters. So I, I would love to do it. And, and, and what better team to work with? I think that was one of the first things that was said when, when Paul and I first met. So I'm excited. Yeah, I'd love to do it. That'd be awesome. Okay, uh, Paul, I'd like to throw it to you. And uh, we're going to start winding down on time here in a minute. And when we talk to you about doing this uh, webinar and, and talking to people in the racing industry throughout the country, and, and we, we have at least one person from Germany here, did you have s some uh, single message, Paul, that, that you want to get through in this webinar on driveline solutions and drag racing? Well, I mean, it, in, uh, in, uh, there's a difference between what Jimmo is talking about and the uh, nitro cars. Uh, you know, he knows more about it, but I'm more, more on the high performance street side. I mean, like I said, it, you know, we, we just provide, you know, a double disc clutches is, is, is really an, a growing solution for multiple applications. So in McLeod, we just continue to develop more and more applications for all the latest cars and, and uh, units that are out there both with more power and even in the you know not just the domestic cars but also uh, some of the uh, import cars too like the bmws the subarus the brz's frs um so so all the different uh, cars whether it's a uh, domestic or european or, or or whatever you know we just continue to stay on top of the technology as much as we can and we like to be the first ones out there with the new applications so uh, we just, you know, we just uh, appreciate all the customers' feedback, and uh, we like working with the new applications. Very good. And Jim kind of touched on this, and we have a question from Damien King, which is a good one. You know, when it comes to rules versus evolving technology, um, are, are, do you have any thoughts about any potential rule changes to open up uh, some of the technology in the future? Is, are there any rules that you feel are, are limiting you in, in progressing uh, technically? Is that, is that for me, John? Oh, well, uh, yeah, go ahead, Jim, go ahead, take it. Well, there's, well, there's a lot of rules in place. And, um, you know, uh, over the years, it seems like the technology, at least on the, the, uh, the nitro side, we kind of outpace what um, NHRA can keep up with as far as, uh, you know, making the cars run quicker and faster. And, you know, over the years, you know, back in the, the mid 90s you know we started developing better superchargers and then you get into the early 2000s when i was with coletta motorsports we uh, started running the first six disc uh, clutch in uh, in a top field dragster on doug's car back in 2003 which then that added a whole nother aspect of uh performance uh to the race cars and then we um then you had the setback blowers you know which made more power everything that we've done over the years just keeps building, allowing us to build more and more horsepower. And it's because we're able to get more fuel volume in the engine, which the, the fuel is what makes the power. So I believe just in any class, you know, pro stock class, pro mod, all of them, you know, we're handcuffed uh, a little bit on what we can do. Um, NHRA definitely does not want to see um, top fuel dragsters or funny cars running 340 miles an hour in uh, the thousand foot. Um, I've been fortunate. I've, I've attended a couple of these eighth mile races down in uh, Ferris, Texas at Extreme Raceway Park and um, got to see some of the fuel alters and pro mods. And, and that's an exciting show. And back in my mind, I'm like, you know, it'd be pretty cool to have like a, an unlimited like outlaw type top fuel or funny car scenario to just run as fast as you can to uh, the eighth mile. And, and I don't think the safety would be an issue, you know, as far as that goes. But um, you're always going to have, I, I always feel that the, the mind of a racer, no matter what kind of racer they are, they outpace whatever, um, you know, uh, really? police, yeah, that, uh, that any sanctioning body has that they can keep up with. So the mind of a racer is, is uh, far advanced over any, anything that any technical police can keep up with, in my opinion. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, and then also I want to ask you, Jim, just a general question. So we, we have this webinar on driveline solutions. Did, did you have any single thing that you approached this webinar with, with a, a message you wanted to give people? Well, for me, you know, I, one of the things I like about um, ePart Trade, and, and it's, it's just the ability to get people together to talk with 
with guys that really know what's going on. You know, I sat uh, a, lot, a couple of weeks ago listening to uh, Lake Speed and and uh, John Cass. Uh, you know, that was awesome. You know, listening and I learned so much just listening to those guys uh, about piston rings and and things like that. And um, does all of it apply to what I do with a nitro engine? Um, no, but there is some things, you know, that makes sense, you know, as we try to build a, a, a better race car. And then, you know, having the ability for people to interact with somebody like Greg or Paul, um, you know, on the driveline side of things, I think this is great. And, and for me, listening to both Paul and Greg, it's, it's a learning experience for me because my exposure to, you know, these things are, is, has been very limited over my life. I've been around drag racing my whole life. But my my whole life has con consisted of cindered iron clutch discs and lock up levers and things like that. And uh, so I think like what Greg and Paul uh, do with both FTI and McLeod is is very fascinating. And I'm starting to really learn more and more about you know street applications and and uh, learning more about uh, the super comp cars and the, our sportsman uh, competitors at the racetrack because they're they're truly the lifeline of um, of all of motorsports, in my opinion. Yeah, very good. And Greg, I want to switch to you and ask you a kind of similar question. Uh, as you came to this webinar on driveline solutions and, and drag racing, was there a single message you want to make sure we, we got out to the racing industry? Um, biggest thing is people keep it fun. Uh, we're, we're all in this. We're all addicts. Every one of us are. We love it. That's why we do it. Uh, Keep it fun, enjoy it, spend time with your family, because every one of those people at the racetrack, they are your family. If you don't believe me, go break a starter off there on the start line and see how many people come offer to give you a starter to make the round. Those are family. Those, that's the type of people that, that you want to associate yourself with, particularly in, in the trying times that we're in today. It's, it's a good walk of people, and you can walk into somebody's trailer you don't even know and, and just shake their hand and say hello, and that's, and that's what you get back. You get somebody shake their hand and say, well, I'm a real family-oriented guy. Uh, and it shows at, at my place of business and with Paul, it's, that's why we all hit along so well and Jim, but if I have to take anything to the whole industry itself is be true to yourself, uh, and, and believe in people, believe in family and, and, and enjoy it. People, this is, this is a lot of fun and it's a special gift to be able to do what we get to do in this country. Yeah. Enjoy it. Well said. And Paul, I have another good question that uh, applies to kind of everybody in racing. And it really has to do with sponsorship. And, and how do you approach the task of not, not just getting a sponsor, but making the sponsorship uh, collaboration work, Paul? Well, I mean, today's world, I mean, the, the, the days 30 years ago, if you're putting your decal on a car for branding, uh, those days are long over. I mean, today it's all about B2B, which is you know, everybody knows it's business to business. Like how can I help my business partner, we call them partners, uh, marketing partners, how can we help them increase their business? Well, through uh, getting them more business. So, you know, having uh, Global Electronic Technology as our partner and FTI and McLeod and Gates and Redline Oil and, and uh, you know, Mac Tools, you know, there are our, our key partners and how do we get them more business? And that's what it's about. It's not just about having the decal on the car, but it's about introducing them to companies that we work with that can increase the business. That's what it's all about is B2B. How, you know, when you go to, uh, if you're a racer and you're out there looking for a marketing partner, the first thing you have to think of is how am I going to increase their business? You know, what benefit is it, is it going to be for them to be working with me? So, you know, in today's world, it's about business to business relationships. I mean, you know, if you can increase their business, then they're more likely to work, work with you. It's, it's all business today. That's very well said, and it's a, there's a responsibility now to, to move the needle when it comes to sales, and it's really great to see just so many race teams recognize that, and they're in that business now. So that kind of is wrapping up the, the questions that we have and some of the questions that I wanted to ask. Is there anything else anybody wants to add as far as Greg and Paul and Jim? I'd like to throw one thing in there. You know, uh, Paul, we were talking a little while ago about things that, that – uh, constant problems or scenarios you see as a company. You know, I, I wake up three o'clock in the morning all the time going, man, what can I do to fix this problem? How do, how do I educate the consumer better to know that this isn't really what you should do? So forth. Uh, Paul touched base on the iron flywheel. And I'm sure you helped me mention I have a thousand horsepower streetcar. Well, 
even though I'm an automatic guy, that thousand horsepower street car has a Tramac in it with a dual disc uh, clutch in it from Paul. And when I did it, I called out there, oh man, I want aluminum flywheel. I mean, I was all about the aluminum flywheel. And you know what I was told? No, you don't. You want, you want the steel flywheel. And I'm thinking this guy has really lost his mind. I want that <laughs> aluminum flywheel. So, but just to verify with him, in fact, when we're done, we're going to take that car to lunch. But that car with that flywheel, and if it had aluminum, I don't think you could drive it. I mean, it's got a pretty snotty camshaft that is a screw blown LS motor. Uh, it is like perfect. You can take off and drive with it like a regular car. Uh, it, guys, he's right. Stay away from it. If you're not drag racing this thing, don't get that aluminum flywheel. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from experience. And we're talking about a guy who's been run everything with a, with a full manual automatic in his entire life, and I got this clutch car. He's telling you the truth. Put, put the iron flywheel in on the street or steel flywheel in on the street. <laughs> First-hand experience, that's all. Very good. Well, Jim and Paul and Greg, uh, thank you so much for being here. This was a, a hell of a lot of fun. I want to tell the folks in our audience, we're going to do it again on August 5th with uh, advance, uh, with AEM and the engine builder, Stefan Papadakis, which is, uh, he's really doing some really interesting things in, in engines right now. So we'll do that August 5th. So thank you very much. This has been a lot of fun. And uh, we're recording it. And so we'll make it available for watching uh, at a later date. And we'll, we'll send everybody an email and telling them that, that this is available for viewing again. And we, we may also send you a password just so you can get in and view it right away. Uh, we just want to make it easy for you. So that uh, brings us to an end. So thank you guys very much. This was fun. It was great to All be right, here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. See you all.